So if you hadn't come to previous presentations, this is me. My name is Blake Dinius. I work as the entomologist educator for Plymouth County Extension. Prior to this role, I used to work in honeybee research. Um, and this is an example of the honeybees we used to grow inside these 48 well plates, uh, plastic well plates, where we'd rear them from first instar all the way to adulthood. But in my current role, I, I no longer do research, I just give education, and this is me at libraries, giving walks, giving talks for kids and adults uh, and, uh, and high school students. But you can really just think of me as a big bug nerd. I really enjoy bugs, I always have my entire life. So what are butterflies? Uh, butterflies, along with moths, are insects in the order Lepidoptera. And this order is just one of many different groups of insects, including grasshoppers, beetles, mantids, stick insects, uh, mayflies. Uh, you, get the, you get the idea. Uh, there is some debate about how many buckets there are. Uh, right now, I've included about 28 different buckets. Um, and this is what we would call an order of insects. So the word Lepidoptera means scaled wing. And you can kind of see this by looking at this uh, pipe vine swallowtail. It's got this nice blue sheen on its hind wing. But if you were to take that and put it under a microscope, you could see maybe the hints of some scales on this wing. And then further up close, you can see it almost looks like shingles on a roof. And so this is what uh, moth dust is and what it might, you might feel if you were to ever pick up a dead butterfly and get some of the color pigment on your fingers. It's actually scales. And these are, what, these are actually modified hairs. They're the hair of an insect that has been flattened to form a scale, uh, which gives butterflies their amazing sheen in, in color. And we can see this really e exemplified in the blue morpho butterfly. If you pay attention to how it's flying, the way that the light kind of interacts with those scales on this, on this morpho butterfly's wings, uh, uh, especially the dorsal, the back right here, uh, is really amazing. It's more than any pigment alone would be able to convey. So why do we watch butterflies other than the fact that they just kind of look cute and pretty? Uh, if you're like me, you know, you, you've had a pretty busy life. Uh, you went to school and then afterward, maybe you thought about getting married or maybe you got married. And then after that, you got a job or maybe before you got married, uh, you, you're, you have this, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with social media, lots of bad news all the time. Uh, you have everyone telling you to do things to become more healthy, you know, exercise more, reduce the stress in your life. And all of that can become very overwhelming in addition to the things that you might actually want to do, like your bucket list. Uh, and so all of this, it just makes this kind of to-do list very overwhelming. Uh, you, you have a lot of things that you're being told to do and things that you have to do. Um, but what butterfly watching does is it really helps you slow down your life. If you walk really fast through a trail, you're going to miss a lot of the butterflies that you may see. You know, during this time of year, maybe in, a, in about a month, I'll be able to sit down at a picnic table and see about 11 species of butterfly in, ten, in uh, 30 minutes, just not even moving, just sitting in one spot, 11 species in 30 minutes. So in addition to watching butterflies, like watching their behavior, like we can see this butterfly nectaring at a flower, you're gonna see a lot more butterflies if you slow your pace down. And so watching butterflies really helps you uh, kind of moderate how quickly you're going through life. It also helps you learn to let go. So a lot of times when you're going out looking for butterflies, you know, a butterfly might show up behind you and then fly away. And that might be very frustrating at first, but over time you get almost this type of zen kind of feeling where you're just like, it is what it is. You know, I, I can't do anything about it. That butterfly could have been cool. It could have been boring, but now it's gone. And you just kind of learn to kind of cope with that. And it, in this world where we're always kind of striving for perfection, striving to be really great at something, you know, watching butterflies kind of keeps us in check, lets us know that we're not going to be able to see everything and that it's okay. In addition to that, there are a lot of very beautiful butterflies, really aesthetically pleasing. Now this might look like just your standard brown butterfly, but if you were to look at this butterfly up close, you might see a lot of different patterns that you might not see otherwise, including like maybe the patterns on its antenna, how it's got these nice stripes, 
um, or even this white intermixed with this brown pattern, this chocolatey brown color, it can be really pleasing just to kind of watch that butterfly up close and see something that, you know, 99 out of 100 people are not noticing when this butterfly passes them by. Again, this is a butterfly that you might see in your yard. Again, looking at really up close, you can see some of these intricate patterns that you might not notice otherwise. And this is another very common butterfly that we would see in our backyards, an eastern tailed blue. You can see this orange pattern on its back and these tails, even how it's like kind of these fuzzy fringe along the edge of its wings can really be pleasing to look at uh, and just really fun to watch. There's the idea of like listers and collectors. So if you're someone who just really likes collecting a bunch of different things, they have all these different kinds of checklists and it really gets into the kind of mode of you really got to catch them all. And this can be a very uh, powerful driving force that gets people out going to look at butterflies every single day. I have a friend of mine who was a really intense birder. So he wasn't as much into butterflies, but you know, he saw, I, one day he saw over a hundred birds in one day, just because he had this idea of collecting and having this lifelong list can be that powerful of a driving force that kind of motivates people to do something, which can be really good in some ways. I mean, it might get you out to get some fresh air. On a day like this, uh, you're listening to me talk when it's beautiful outside. So hopefully you've taken your laptop and you're sitting on the porch, but if not, uh, hopefully you get out there and look at some butterflies after this. But anyways, if you need additional motivation to go outside, uh, having a list or a collection can be that motivation. And the third one is I think what kind of motivates a lot of people to watch butterflies, which is a deeper understanding of nature. So everyone's familiar with this monarch butterfly we have here. And we know that it works as a pollinator where it's pollinating these flowers. You can see it taking a drink from this flower right here. But what a lot of people seem to forget when they look at this pretty butterfly is that it started out as a caterpillar. And this caterpillar is dependent on milkweed as a plant. And then in turn, this plant is dependent on a variety of ecological conditions such as having a large exposure of sun, a lot of sunlight exposure, and even the kind of soil that grows in that environment. So knowing a butterfly is in an area might indicate all these things from what conditions the, the plant is growing in, how much sun it gets, what kind of soil it is around that area, is it acidic, is it basic, is it more clay, you know, higher clay composition, and even the health of those plants growing in that area as well. So you can learn a lot about butterflies and, and see how everything is all connected just from, from watching them um, because they're so uh, intimately connected to their environment. And even uh, as people get into the habit of gardening, and this is just one example of how flower arrangement is a recently published study of how flower arrangement can really impact uh, butterflies. So I'm gonna go over this really quick. I know I just said it wasn't as science-based, but I can't help myself. Um, in this particular study, what they found is that if you were going to plant milkweed, it works best in the arrangement A, where the M's are a border of milkweed separated by a, like a barrier of, of space. And in the middle, you have a bunch of wildflowers versus the other two arrangements where you might have wildflowers on the outer edge in B and B and milkweed in the middle, or C, which I would think is the most natural approach, which is just milkweed and wildflowers mixed all in together. That's what you tend to see. Um, but, but B and C were less uh, conducive to monarchs than A, just having that very strict border of milkweed around these wildflowers in the middle. But other butterflies, moving on, other butterflies are also dependent on certain flowers. So this is a great spangled fritillary. And this butterfly is highly dependent on violets, any kind of violet, not necessarily a certain species of violet, but just having violets around. Without violets, this great spangled fritillary would no longer exist. It would, it would go extinct. This red admiral is dependent on thistle. So you, if you have thistle in your yard, you might see this red admiral. The black swallowtail is gonna be attracted to things like parsley and dill and that kind of group of plants. So you're gonna, it's gonna need that there. Pipe vine swallowtail is gonna uh, breed on Aristolochia. That's a family 
but that also includes um, on the second picture below wild ginger is part of, is a part of the same family as Aristolochia. So you can, it can, you can see it growing on either of those. This is a wild indigo dusky wing. And so you might think of this maybe just a little gray brown moth, but it's actually a butterfly. And true to its name, wild indigo dusky wing is gonna want wild indigo. But because we don't have as much wild indigo around, this butterfly is actually adapted to the exotic species, the non-native species, species uh, plant crown vetch. And that's what that second picture in the, below is, is crown vetch. In the same way, the Baltimore checker spot has done the same thing. So it normally feeds on turtle head, has adapted to English plantain. So some butterflies, they are completely dependent on certain groups of plants. And what we can see is that others have adapted to these exotic species of plants, the ones that we've imported into this country. Looking at butterflies can also teach you a little bit about what we call phenology, which is the, the way that things emerge over the course of a year. So when you can see at the bottom of this graph, you've got the brown elephant, hoary elephant, frosted elephant, henry elephant, all these elephant tend to come out from April until June. And that's what these little bars represent. On the other hand, the, the hair streaks above it are more from June to August. And so you can see is this transition from, from types of butterflies to other species of butterfly as the year goes on. And for a lot of people that can be very entertaining and keep things fresh, knowing that certain butterflies can be seen at certain times of the year. That being said, if you wanted to see these elfin below, I, a good place to go is Miles Standish, and they're gonna be going away within the next couple of weeks. So if you really wanted to see them uh, going down to Mile Sandish today would be a really good time. They get a good glimpse of the brown elephant. You know, hoary elephant, you really won't see anywhere outside of a, a Mile Sandish. So being able to see a hoary elephant would be really fun. Same thing with frosted elephant and the eastern pine elephant too. There are many, many species of butterfly, well, just insects in general. So the a recent study in 2018 predicted there are about 303 undiscovered mammals. Now, when it comes to insects, there are probably over 30 million. Some people estimate it in the billions of undiscovered insects. And then that goes to include butterflies as well. So even though butterflies are very pretty, very big, uh, recently, uh, within the past 10 years, a new species of swallowtail was discovered right over here in the Northeast. And it was called the Appalachian swallowtail. And you can see this uh, big yellow butterfly. Uh, we have the tiger swallowtail and the Canadian tiger swallowtail. And what we didn't realize is this, that Appalachian swallowtail existed uh, within them for, you know, forever. And, and we only just discovered it in 2011. And this is one example of just the two side by side. You've got the Appalachian swallowtail, a much bigger yellow butterfly in the, in the back, and then a regular Canadian tiger swall, or sorry, yeah, Canadian tiger swallowtail up front. So in Massachusetts, there are over 100 species of butterfly that you can regularly see. There's probably about 122 on uh, total, but uh, you know, in terms of just regularly seeing them, uh, about 100 species. And they come in all different shapes, sizes, colors. Um, there weren't 100 images here that would have taken me forever to kind of piece them together, but you get the idea. Lots of different colors, lots of different shapes and sizes. So diversity is all around you, just waiting to be discovered. You just have to go out there and do it. Um, it's just one of those things that once you start doing it, you start to really understand how much is out there. And you, you know, when you go out looking for butterflies, you're gonna see other things. You're gonna be seeing cool mammals. You're gonna be seeing foxes, uh, other cool beetles, cool bees, lots of different things, just waiting out there to be discovered. So what do you need to get started? Getting into butterfly watching is not that expensive. There is a small amount of money that you do need to fork over, but it, it shouldn't break the bank. Um, the first thing you need is a sense of adventure. You need to want to do this. And the second thing you need is something to see them with. And this is really where things start to kind of get more expensive. So a pair of binoculars might cost a decent amount. The pair on the left costs about 100 bucks. The pair on the right I, I believe costs about 30 bucks. So it doesn't really need to cost too much and they're both work really well. Um, what are some things you're looking for? So the first thing is magnification power. That's what this number in the beginning represents where it says seven X. That means looking at a butterfly will magnify it seven times the normal amount. Um, so that's what that, that number 
at the, at the front is. Bigger is not necessarily always better. Um, sometimes you do want to stick with a lower number, but I would say anything from seven to 10 is going to work. One of the really important things with butterfly watching is a short minimum focus. And that, because walking closer, so if you have a lower magnification and you just walk up closer to that butterfly, it's going to look bigger. So having a short minimum focus distance is really important. And I would say, don't get anything over 10 feet. So that, that's even more important than magnification power is how closely uh, uh, the binoculars can magnify something at. The second number is, is how bright something is gonna appear. So if you look at the two images, uh, this is a, uh, a, wood, a wood satyr. Um, this, is gonna, this is gonna look different in, in different lights. So this is typically a woodland species. So uh, it, depending on you know, what your objective lens size is, is gonna really impact the quality of how this butterfly looks. And then the quality of the lens. So if you really go and get something very cheap, like, like a $20 pair of binoculars, things might just appear very blurry to you. Or if they're used and they're all scratched up, they might just appear very, very blurry. So quality of the lens. And if you buy something that's like $400, that's really not most of the time going to be that much better than something that was like 80 bucks. Uh, that it's almost like wine, where the really expensive wine it doesn't taste that much better than the $8 bottle of wine, at least to me. Uh, if you have trouble taking photos or looking at something, um, and this is a lot of times I get pictures of bugs and they look like this, just a general blurry picture. This is actually a cockroach and I've become very keen at identifying blurry pictures. Uh, what you wanna do is just get up close. So taking pictures can really help, getting up close with cameras or binoculars. Your camera phone, can work uh, really well at taking good pictures. Um, and then third, you need something to record what you see. So this should be very cheap, just a piece of paper. A uh, piece of paper, pencil, something that tucks into your back pocket, or you can get fancy and have a butterfly checklist. I actually have a checklist that I've compiled. So if you're interested in getting that checklist, I can email that out to you. Just shoot me an email saying you want the checklist and I'll send that on your way. And so you found something cool, right? So you, you have your binoculars, you have your pencil and paper, you see something that looks very, very interesting. What do you do now? You want to identify, you want to figure out what you found. And the best way to do this is with a field guide. Uh, there are some apps that you can get on phones and they work okay. But the problem with apps and butterflies is that you need a picture in order to identify it. When you have a field guide and you have that information in your head and how to identify something, you can do that very quickly and you might even be able to learn how to identify butterflies as they're flying. So you don't even need to see them or wait for them to land. You'll just know, okay, that's the general flight pattern. And this is the general image. It's an orange butterfly or a yellow butterfly. It has to be this. Um, so the field guides are definitely a good investment. I particularly like Kaufman's field guide at the top. I like the, the images that they give you, but the butterflies through binoculars or the swift guide written by Jeffrey Glassberg, most of the people I know that tend to prefer this guide. So I tend to be more of an outlier when it comes to Kaufman's, but if you're gonna, you can't really lose with any three of these guides. I would just pick the cheapest one or, or you know, browse, browse through the books on Amazon or a local bookstore, Barnes and Noble, uh, and just get a good idea uh, for what you like, but they all work really well. They can be butterfly identification and field guides can look can be very, very frustrating at first. Some of the butterflies look exactly alike. They look so identical. It's just really frustrating and hard to tell them apart. Uh, this is an example of juveniles dusky wing on the left and horses on the right. Uh, there are some very subtle differences um, and you do pick up on that as you get uh, started. But my big uh, message to you is don't get overwhelmed. It doesn't have to be accomplished in one day. This can be something that you get better at throughout the course of your life. What I would recommend now, and this is some advice that I wish I had when I started, is start identifying the common species and the easy ones. Don't just try to do everything all at once, because that's what I did. That's kind of how I try to do everything. I try to do everything all at once, really, really fast. Um, and so, you know, butterflies were great for me for forcing me to kind of slow down. Um, and so we're going to give you uh, this butterfly ID crash course today. 
don't worry about it if you don't remember everything, um, but I'm gonna try to teach you how to identify some common species that you might see even today, even on a day like this starting now. So they're gonna be more of the spring, summertime butterflies and the common ones that you're gonna find in a backyard, ones that you won't really need to travel very far in order to see. So the first thing is that butterflies come in three general sizes and there's, it's less like, a, it's more like a gradient. So there's some that are small, some that are large, but in general, there are three sizes. So you've got this tiger swallowtail here. It's about four to five inches. So if you hold out your hand, if you look at your palm, going from the base of your palm to the tip of your middle finger, that's about the wingspan of this tiger swallowtail, about four to five inches. So that's how big you're thinking. The next butterflies we have are the medium ones. And these kind of run the full gamut. Um, but they're, they're a lot smaller than the, than the uh, tiger swallowtail. If you look at the picture of this hand, you can see that they might only be as long as like your index finger. And then lastly, we have the small butterflies, which is the eastern tail blue right here. And this might only be about the size of your thumbnail or your big toenail. They're, they're much, much smaller. So this is the three general size categories. So first up on our butterfly crash course, we have the tiger swallowtail. And true to its name, it has these tiger-like stripes on it of black and yellow. And on its body, it also has black stripes on a yellow body. So that's the best way. Tiger swallowtail should be very easy to identify. But it does have a black form. So the females occasionally will sport this all black form. And it can be very confusing because there are some other black dark swallowtails around our area. But the female dark tiger swallowtail doesn't have any markings on its body. And I learned this from a, a website where the best way to remember this, and this really just stuck with me, is to remember that tigers don't have spots. So the other dark swallowtails will have spots on their bodies, but tiger swallowtails will not. So the first dark swallowtail is the black swallowtail. And you can see that it has this black spot on its hind wing surrounded by orange. It has an orange marking uh, on its hind wing. And it has the, the, the yellow spots. Once again, the tiger swallowtail will not have those yellow spots. And the spice bush swallowtail. So it has a more faded kind of blue marking on its back wing. It has this blue comet on its hind wing too, where the arrow's pointing to. You can see that blue, the, the orange spots interrupted by that blue comet is one good way to know it's a spice bush swallowtail. And once again, it has those yellow spots that the tiger swallowtail does not have. So we're gonna have a poll. So I want you to guys to try to identify this butterfly and, uh, and, tell, and we're gonna give it a few seconds and see what you think it is. Is it a tiger swallowtail, a black swallowtail, or a spice bush swallowtail? And it's okay to guess as well. I have the poll, the poll anonymous, so I won't even see who got it right or wrong. All right, so we, we actually had about 83% of the people get this right. Um, This is a black swallowtail. And you can tell that it's not one of the dark tiger swallowtails because it's got spots on its abdomen. And it's got the two black spots you can see circled in orange on its back wings. That separates it from the spice bush swallowtail. So the first medium sized butterfly we have is the American lady. This is a very common orange butterfly. Now I know you guys know how to identify monarchs, but we're gonna go over some other orange butterflies. The American lady has uh, a white dot on its forewing right there where the arrow's pointing to, and it has two eye spots on its hind wing. So that's, that's, those are the two best features. What I personally like to use is this right here. If you look at the two black markings, you can see that they don't connect. And that's one good way of remembering the American lady. And so that's really important is to look at the white dot, the two eye spots, 
and how these black markings don't connect on that forewing. The painted lady, on the other hand, very, very similar looking. You can see that that black marking does connect on it. It does not have that white dot on its forewing. And it has way more eye spots on that hind wing if you look below. Instead of the two big ones, it's got like five eye spots, four big ones, and then maybe a, a small circle. Um, but and it, it looks very different on that hind wing underneath. So that's the painted lady. Morning cloaks, very, very different. This is probably my favorite butterfly. It's really unmistakable. You've got, it's the only butterfly that has this yellow fringe on the border, chocolatey brown on the center, and then uh, this, these blue dots. And it looks almost like a leaf when the wings are closed. Common buckeye, uh, very, again, very unique looking butterfly. It's got many, many eye spots uh, all, all over it. They call it a buckeye because these are supposed to apparently look like a deer's eyes. Um, I hadn't known that, but that's where it gets its name. So what's this butterfly? I want you to take a second to try to identify this one. Is it the American lady, the painted lady, the morning cloak, or the common buckeye? And again, it's okay to guess if you, if you just have no idea, that's fine. So this is the American lady. And you can tell, again, it's got that white dot on its forewing and it's got that the black spots aren't quite connecting. Um, we can see the very closely related painted lady on the top left right there. You can see where the black really connects. It does not have that white dot on its forewing. So they're very, very similar, but paying attention to just those few characteristics can really help separate the two. And the, the American lady, very, very common in this area, um, very easy to see. Next up, we have uh, the, the cabbage white. Um, so this is probably the most common butterfly you're going to see around your yard. Um, cabbage whites, they're pretty easy to recognize. All white butterfly. On the forewing, they either have one dot or two dots. The males have one dot, the females have two dots. And they have this uh, black mark or this dark mark on the tips of their forewing. So th that's the easiest way. They don't have any, really any other dark markings around, just the two dots and then the black marking towards the tips of their wing. The clouded sulfur, so this is a common butterfly you might see in your yard. This has a broad band of dark here, so it's not like the cabbage white. Um, and underneath it's got this kind of what they call a cell. It's just a white circle, a series of white circles. Um, and you can see that the female is white, very white. It might look like a cabbage white, but as long as you pay attention to how thick that border is on that wing, you're going to be able to very easily separate it from a cabbage white. So if it's got that thick border where the arrow's pointing to, that's a clouded sulfur and, it, and it's all white. It's not a cabbage white. Orange sulfurs are very similar to the clouded sulfur, but if you look, they're way more pigmented. They're very, very orange. This black border is incredibly thick. Um, you can even see it through the wing, how it's much, much thicker than you were to look at, uh, let's say, a clouded sulfur here. A much thinner border, much thicker border in the orange sulfur. So you can, that's the best way to separate them too, is orange and thick black border in the orange sulfur, and then a lot more faint in the clouded sulfur, a lot more cloudy, if you will. So we're going to go ahead and do another poll. So what do you think this butterfly is? Is it the cabbage white, the clouded sulfur, or the orange sulfur?
this is the clouded sulfur. And you can tell that it's not a cabbage white because it's got that thick black border. And it's also a very white butterfly. So the orange sulfur is not gonna be this white, um, even though the, this border does look very thick. Uh, that, that is something to point out, but it's, it is a white butterfly and your orange sulfur is not gonna be this pigmented. Um, it can be sometimes, but in general, it's not. There's some overlap, which makes it really confusing, but, um, but this is, this, that, that's a good way to try to separate the two. Uh, for our first of the small butterflies, we have the Eastern tailed blue. This is a very common butterfly. It's most, it can be blue, but it can also be gray, the color. If you're looking at the, uh, the top part on the left, uh, the best way to tell the Eastern tail blue is you look for the tails on the back wing. And if you see on the top, there's not that much orange, just a tiny, tiny bit of orange. And on the bottom, it's got that orange surrounding the tail again, and then spots all over the wing. So that's the, that's the Eastern tail blue. The spring azure, and there's some debate on whether the spring azure is one species or about you know seven different species. Um, but for this presentation, we're just gonna consider it all one species. Um, you can tell the eastern tail blue apart from the spring azure is that the spring azure does not have a tail. Um, and so even though the bottom has those speckled black spots all over the over the wings. It doesn't have a tail, it doesn't have any orange markings. It's just a blue butterfly with no tail, no orange markings, and it does have those speckled black spots on the underneath side. The gray hair streak is a butterfly that might look very similar to the eastern tail blue. It's got tails, it's got orange markings or near the tail, but these orange markings are much larger than what you would see in an eastern tail blue. And on the bottom, it doesn't have those speckles. It just has these black bars, black and white bars. Almost looks like a Oreo cookie. If you took off the top of an Oreo cookie and kind of laid them down side by side, um, that's kind of what it reminds me of at least. But it's very different. And gray hair streaks underneath are very, very gray. Um, there's, they're very, very, they're a very pleasing shade of gray. So we're going to go ahead and ask another poll. Um, there's only one more after this, but. What do you guys think this one is? Is it the Eastern tail blue, the spring azure, or the gray hair streak? So this is an eastern tail blue. Um, and you can tell because even though it has, it has tails, which separate it from the spring azure, and even though it does have orange on its tail, you can see that that orange is not nearly as extensive as what you would see in the gray hair streak. And lastly, we have two uh, small orange butterflies. You've got the American copper right here. And you can see the American copper has these very distinct large polka dots on its forewing. And it also has this really large, wide uh, orange band on its hind wings. In contrast, the pearl crescent has almost like this lacy pattern on a, both its forewing and hind wing. And what gets its name, uh, pearl crescent, is an actual white crescent mark on the underneath of its hind wing. So on the bottom hind wing, you can see where that arrow is pointing to this white crescent. Um, that's where it gets its name. So your American copper will not have that. And the American copper has the black polka dot pattern on its forewing. So what's this butterfly?
this butterfly is the pearl crescent. And you can tell because the American copper has those black, very defined black polka dots on its forewing versus the pearl crescent has more of a lacy pattern on its forewing. So how do you go about finding butterflies? So that's the last of the quizzes. Uh, no more, I promise. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit of tips on how you can go about finding butterflies around your area. So you can really just sit in your back porch and wait for them to come to you. But you're only going to get certain species because butterflies, again, are very specific to the habitats that they're in. So the weather that they like, they like sunny, warm, uh, really from about 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, so right around now is a really great time to go and look for butterflies. Not very windy. You do have some butterflies flying when it's, uh, you know, 15 miles per hour wind. But in general, they like it to be very calm days, especially the small butterflies um, like it to be very calm. When you're going out to look for butterflies, it's really, really important that you slow down your walking pace. You want to walk very, very slowly. If you try to walk too quickly, you're going to spook the butterflies very easily. Um, I, I just take a couple steps at a time, uh, just really kind of moderating how quickly I get through a trail. Really big thing is watch your shadow because you might find a butterfly, you can never get close to a butterfly, it keeps flying away and not realize that it's your shadow that's actually scaring them away. So taking a wide path around so that your shadow doesn't touch any butterflies can really uh, improve your ability to get up close and watch them. You wanna look up, down, and all around. So your larger butterflies, like your tiger swallowtail, these are gonna be very high, they're very strong flyers. So you very often see them flying very, very high, sometimes even above trees. The medium-sized butterflies, you might find flying at a medium height. So maybe just a little bit above your head or maybe about waist height around that kind of area. And then the small butterflies, like your eastern tail blue, you might find only flying knee height or below. In addition to that, something like this question mark butterfly really tends to inhabit uh, what we call an ecotone or like the border between a woods and a field. So in, so in addition to looking up and down and finding butterflies distributed um, vertically, you might find the butterflies distributed horizontally as well, and where you find, might find more butterflies situated according uh, near the edge of a, a forest in a lawn, for instance. So going along with how the butterflies are dependent on certain plants, going to an area with different plants could mean different butterflies, which is re very, really very exciting when you go to explore a different area. So your yard is gonna mimic more of a meadow type environment. Um, but if you go into the deep woods, you might find some more deciduous butterflies, something like that question mark butterfly. It doesn't actually feed on flowers, it feeds, feeds on tree sap. So you're going to want to go to an area, it, you're mostly going to find that in areas where you're going to have tree sap. Um, coniferous forest or pine barrens, you're going to find different kinds of butterflies. The eastern pine elfin, you're not going to find in a deciduous forest. Uh, beaches have different butterflies, maybe some more migratory species. And then again, the ecotone. So the border between these areas might have different species than any one of those two environments alone. Miles Standish State Forest, really good place to go right now because this is where you're going to find, um, this is where you're going to find your eastern pine elfin here and uh, your hoary elfin right here. Douglas S. Westgate, this is a property in Wareham. This is where you're going to find your wood nymph and your wood satyr. Um, you can find these in other places, but this is a really good place to find them. In addition to that, uh, Douglas S. Westgate, because you've got the, a lot of these, it's almost like it's like a reclaimed bog habitat, you're going to find a lot of dragonflies and stuff in that area too. So a good place to go if you're looking for different things. Um, this place in Halifax is called Cumberland Farms IBA. It's not the gas station, it's an actual farm. Uh, you're going to find more of a, a not Bigfoot, but more of these uh, meadow species. So a lot of the clouded sulfurs, you can find a lot of common buckeyes, you can find a lot of the painted ladies and American ladies there, red admirals, 
a lot of different, more of your meadow type species, but you're going to find a lot more of them than you might find in your backyard. So a good place to go and good place to go for dragonflies too. And lastly, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Uh, with butterflies, it's one of those things, like I said, you kind of find this kind of zen moment where a butterfly just gets away from you and that's it. You just have to be okay with it. And it's fun that way. I find that it really helps me put things back in perspective. And at this point, I'll take any questions that anyone might have.